first virtual Arkansas Valley Audubon Society program. I'm Megan Wilbar, museum coordinator for the InfoZone Museum at the Rawlings Library, and have the pleasure of introducing both the president of the Arkansas Valley uh, Audubon Society, Dr. Peg Rooney, and our presenter and community naturalist, Zach Hutchinson. Um, Dr. Peg Rooney is the president of the Arkansas Valley Audubon Society. Her concern for the environment and the wildlife has been lifelong, but her specific love of birds began when she saw a golden eagle on a tree on a rural road. The next day, she bought a pair of binoculars and the bird guide and a passion for the protection of birds and their habitats began. Jack Hut Zach Hutchinson is a community naturalist and the community science coordinator for the Audubon Rockies. Zach authored The Great Wyoming Bird Trail and Birding in Yellowstone National Park. His passion with Audubon is focused on engaging students and adults with experimental learning through his various bird banding programs. Uh, thank you both for being here this evening and taking the time to help us all become better birders. Um, Craig, could you start us off with information about uh, the Arkansas Valley Audubon Society? Sure, sure. Uh, I want to welcome you all here tonight and I want to encourage you to take a stand for birds. A Science Magazine in 2019 reported that we have lost three billion birds since the 70s and there are ongoing assaults against the environment and protections for birds and their habitats. So it's, it's up to us to, to, to step up and help because birds are an indicator of the health of the planet. And if they're in trouble, we're in trouble. So one of the ways that we can step up and help is to join the local Audubon chapter and the National Audubon Society. That way we can leverage our voices with millions of other people who care about birds. So you can find membership information for Arkansas Valley Audubon Society on our website, socobirds.org. So Southern Colorado, S-O-C-O, socobirds.org. Thank you and enjoy the program. And I'll let Zach take it away. Hey, good evening, everyone. I'm going to jump right in and start our slide presentation. So hopefully you can you can see my screen. You can see this lovely northern sawwit owl, and you can see this is a, a presentation that I give. Uh, I refer to it as my beginner's bird ID or birding 101, however you want to say it. Um, but it's basically it's giving you the tools and ideas you need to start and you know really get into that which is called bird watching or birding. Um, real quick, Audubon Rockies. Um, is the regional office of the National Audubon Society. Um, and our mission is to protect birds in the places they need today and tomorrow. So we serve, uh, we're part of the Central Flyway and we serve the tri-state region of Colorado, Utah and Wyoming. And that's actually where I am from. I am, uh, I'm in Casper, Wyoming right now, um, giving this presentation virtually to everyone. And our head office is located in Fort Collins. Um, if you have questions, concerns, you want to stay in touch with, with me or with uh, Rockies in general, here's all of our contact information. My email, zach.hutchinson at audubon.org. Uh, we have a Twitter page, an Instagram page. If you just want to see pretty bird pictures, who doesn't? Uh, our website is rockies.audubon.org and then Audubon Rockies on Facebook. We're pretty easy to find. Um, we have a newsletter that goes out every month that talks about major conservation issues and also uh, you know, uh, great conservation victories in our region and also just fun stories, educational stories, things like that. Um, real quick about me. Uh, so this, this photo was actually taken in Lima, Peru, uh, where I was teaching a bird banding course. Um, and I'm with a, a little parrotlet there. And that little parrotlet was biting me very viciously, I might add, which is why I'm laughing because it hurt. <laughs> it hurt very badly. Um, and so for Audubon Rockies, I'm the community science coordinator. And one of the, the major things that I do is I coordinate all of our bird banding efforts. Um, I, I maintain all of our records. Uh, I train all of our, our volunteers and, uh, and I just, I help to keep things running smoothly on our, our field research efforts. And I coordinate and collaborate with other organizations as well on their field research. Um, on a, on a personal note, I also have a personal blog that's all about birds called flockingaround.com. And it's just a, it's a fun 
it's a fun place for birds. Um, if, if you like to laugh and learn a little bit more about birds, it's just a fun place about birds. And you'll see a lot of my photos are, are from that as well. Uh, that Northern Sawwood Owl, for instance, uh, is, is one of my photos. So including this beautiful Western tanager. And I will try to make sure I name all the birds that you see on these slides. Uh, I hope I don't forget one, but uh, they should all be labeled as well somewhere on the slide, okay? So let's jump into it. And what better way than a bird that uh, many people already know, which is the black cap chickadee. So as a bird nerd, as someone who's getting into birds, interested in birds, what do you need to get started? Some people might tell you, well, you need binoculars. You need a scope with a tripod. You need field guides. You need checklists. You need a life list. You need bird song CDs, software, blah, blah, blah. That's a lot of stuff. And if you're just trying it out to decide, do, do I enjoy this? That's a little too much. So what I say you really need, you need time, you need a lot of patience, and you need a place where you can find birds. Um, and those are the three things you really need. Now, to help supplement those things, a pair of binoculars and a field guide are very helpful. And a field guide doesn't have to be a book. There are countless free bird guide apps existing on the smartphone marketplaces. But if you are going to get binoculars, they can be confusing. Bigger does not always mean better when it comes to bird watching with binoculars. So first thing I like to do is just teach people what are the numbers of binoculars and how do you pick a pair of binoculars for bird watching? So the first number, that is your magnification. Okay, that's how many times uh, closer that object or bird appears to your eye. Okay, so it's strengthening your eye by eight times, okay? The second number is the front lens diameter, and that is how much light is actually let into the monocular. So how bright and crisp is the, the object or bird you're seeing, okay? I tell people, oops, I tell people never go over uh, the 10 by 42 mark because the problem is once you do that, you get really heavy binoculars. So you don't want to go over that that second number. You can see that 42. If you start to go over 42, then your binoculars get really heavy. And if you're holding them all day out in the field, your arms and neck are going to be sore. In a couple months, they might also be really buff, but they will be sore when you start out. The, the first number, if you have any shake in your hands, the more you zoom, the more that shake is amplified. So if you have a lot of shake in your hands, maybe go with a smaller binocular that's less weight and less zoom, maybe a six by 32 or six by 25, just to start out with the seat, you know, how does that feel? And you don't need to go all the way up into those large $2,000 binocular price ranges to get a good set of binoculars. Celestron makes a very reasonably priced pair. It's less than $70 of eight by 42s, okay? If you're gonna get a scope, you're gonna see the price goes up significantly. And if you get serious into bird watching, you might want that scope because distant birds like shorebirds, ducks, and waders oftentimes are going to be a distance away from you, especially if they're in water, right? So the scope helps to basically put you a little bit closer, aiding in your identification, okay? And as with binoculars, make sure you're testing your scope before you purchase because it's a big investment. And then think about all the things you got to go, go with it. You have to have a tripod for a scope. And where I'm at in Wyoming, if you don't have a heavy scope, the wind will just shake your poor little scope uh, so badly you will not see a thing. So you have to take all of those into consideration. Okay. Field guides. Now, like I said, there are free apps and we're going to get into those. Um, but if you're a paper person, if you want a, a book, something that's physical that you can hold on to, my personal recommendation is the Sibley Guide. Um, just all around, it is the best guide for, for introducing people to birds and birding, okay? Now, if you get that guide, make sure to read the first 34 pages, I believe it is, because those th first 34 pages tell you how to use the guide. And that is oftentimes the problem that confuses people is they get the guide, they flip it right open to these pretty plates with all these birds on it, without learning how to use the guide first. So read those first 34 pages. It's a lot of pictures, but it helps you to understand how Sibley constructs his guide, okay? So if you get one of these, 
read those first pages. Now, if you want a free app, there are plenty out there. If you have a smartphone, then these are great. Um, the, the far left one here on, on my screen is, is the Merlin app. It's the one showing the evening grow speak and pine grow speak. Um, the Merlin app is, is fairly unique in that not only can you, you scroll through it to find a bird you think you saw, but also it can utilize an image and help to identify it for you. Now that takes some of the fun out of it sometimes, but it does have those, those capabilities. And then it'll also, using eBird data, it'll show you uh, the expectancy of, of that particular bird at your location, um, you know, for, for the months of the year. So you can see with that evening grow speak, uh, I had it, uh, when I took the screenshot, I had it set in Casper. And you can see evening grow speaks are expected almost year round uh, in the Casper area. But the red dot there shows that uh, they're, uh, they're fairly uncommon. While they are expected, you're not, you're not likely to see a lot of them, okay? Um, the next app is the Audubon app. Um, and the National Audubon Society just revamped this app, and it's a beautiful app, and it, uh, it, it, it's a great, great app. And it also utilizes eBird data, and it also can help walk you through identification using your location, field marks, um, and other things, and size. It, it'll walk you through an identification. Okay, and again, that can sometimes take the fun out of it, but if you're struggling with a bird, it helps you narrow it down, okay? So, and these are free apps. You don't have to pay a dime for them. Um, you can just download them right off the marketplace. Uh, the next app is uh, Hawkwatch International's Raptor ID app. If you love diurnal raptors, so hawks and eagles, uh, there is no better app. Um, none of the other apps even come close to providing you with complete and useful information on raptors. So if you specifically love raptors, the Raptor ID app is the, the app for you. Okay. And then eBird. eBird is just a community science project that basically allows you to input your bird sightings and it'll track your, your life list, meaning the birds you've seen over the course of your life. It'll track your life list and it contributes it all to a large database that is used for conservation decision making. Um, so it's, it's critical for conservation. Um, but also it's a useful tool for you because it helps you track all the cool things you've seen, when, where, et cetera. Okay. So, uh, make sure to, to check out the eBird app also, you know, if you're getting more and more into this. Okay. Now, if at any point in time you have a question or comment, um, if you type it into, uh, whatever you're watching on, I won't be able to see it right now because my screen is just filled with this, this slideshow, but I will get to them at the end after I, I return the screen to normal, okay? So if you have questions or comments, just tap them in there and, and uh, I will get to them, okay? Um, if you're on social media, which some of you are, if you're watching on Facebook, there are groups out there uh, for people who are interested in birds, okay? What's this bird is a, is a group where you can submit a photo of a bird with a date and location and they will help you identify it and they'll tell you how they identified it often, okay? The Raptor ID group, this is the same group uh, that a lot of the people in this were the same people that helped put together that Raptor ID app. And you can see they endorsed the free Raptor ID app. Uh, ducks and geese or other waterfowl, there's a group for that. It's called Duck, Duck, Goose Waterfowl Identification, okay? And they'll help you with the craziest looking ducks like the one you see there. All right, if, you, if sparrows really get you down, well, guess what? There's a group for sparrows too, okay? Websites, Cornell Lab of Ornithology, uh, they're the, the organization that puts out eBird. They have a website, All About Birds is their entry level one. They have uh, free, free little mini courses you can take on building your bird identification skills. Um, Birds of North America is their more advanced one. It is a paid subscription site, but it is, it is a very complete uh, amount of information. And it actually just got upgraded to Birds of the World. Um, so Birds of North America now is part of Birds of the World. And it's just complete information, okay? Um, National Audubon Society has a, on, an online field guide utilizing David Sibley's uh, uh, artwork and, and information from Ken Kaufman. So uh, you can use that. It is free as well. And then eBird also has uh, a part of, of their site uh, devoted to helping you learn more about birds as well. So you can go uh, through the explorer area and just explore species of birds, okay? 
If you're interested in learning bird sounds, um, there's a couple of uh, free options out there. Um, bird Academy is, is a free way to learn bird sounds. Um, and then there's also some, some apps that uh, will actually help you to identify bird sounds if you're struggling to do so on your own. And then there's a paid one called Larkwire, and it's a, it's a quiz game. It's a game that, that uh, allows you to learn bird songs while quizzing, and it, it, it will put you through the challenges, but you will come out a better birder by ear if you utilize it, okay? Audubon also has a birding by ear uh, page that uh, will, again, help you strengthen your birding by ear skills. Now, when it comes to identifying a bird, if you just tried to memorize all the birds that exist in the world, you're talking about 10,000 plus species of bird. Plus, there are differences between males, females, juveniles, immatures, seasonal plumage changes, definitive plumage changes, genetic mutations, hybrids, and more. You're talking about so many differences that, excuse me, trying to memorize all of them would be very difficult. Okay. So, learning the skill to walk through a bird identification is better than just trying to memorize every single bird. And that's what we're gonna focus on uh, for the rest of this presentation is just how to get those skills to identify a bird, okay? How to better use your field guide, um, how to better use your, your binoculars, all of those things, focusing into identifying a bird, okay? Uh, make sure to, to take a stretch at some point. You know, sitting in a chair for, for too long can uh, can make you start to get sleepy and, and lose focus. So make sure, like this trumpeter swan, make sure to stretch out really good. Get a drink of water. Okay, let's jump in. So the basics of bird identification. When you observe a bird, think of the three things that are going on. What can you see? That is the visible. What can you hear? That is the audible. And then what is your context? And by context, I mean, where are you? Where are you in the world? Where are you in a habitat? Okay, are you in a grassland? Are you in riparian corridor? Think about your context. Okay, so those three things, they all tie together and they all lend to identification. Now, sometimes one of them may not be part of the puzzle, okay? You might only see the bird not hear it, and only have context then to go with. If that's the case, use those two to start your bird identification. Use what's visible, use what your context is. Next, you're going to step into what's called jizz or, or jis. It depends on who you're talking to. Different birders will pronounce it differently, okay? But it originates from a uh, general impression of size and shape. So when you see a bird, many of you can see this silhouette on the screen right now. Uh-oh, what just happened? There we go. Many of you can see this bird on the screen right now. And you can probably guess that it is a goose. I didn't give you any hints. I just gave you a silhouette. Now, you maybe you can't tell which species of goose it is but you can tell it's a goose. You just used gis. You use general impression of size and shape to start identification of that species. And that you, so you used the visible, okay? You used what you could see and you started in the process of identifying a bird. And that's generally where you want to start, okay? Um, so if we go to, I call it, uh, sometimes I call it the stairway to bird ID heaven or the, the, the bird pyramid of identification, whatever you want to call it, okay? Those are the things you want to start with. You start with shape. Then maybe you go to size. How does it compare to other birds around it? Or how does it compare to objects around it? Then you go to markings or field marks. Then maybe you take into consideration what's audible. Did it make any sounds? If not, think about your context, your habitat. What else is context? Behavior. Think about all those things, and as you start to use these same pathways over and over and over, you'll strengthen your, your bird ID skills to the point where you get to, and this is why I call it the, the bird 
stairway to heaven is because at the very top is identifying an excipiter with nothing but a silhouette. Okay, and that is where we want to go with our skills. We want to build up to that level. So start with shape or size. Those two kind of go together as we just saw with, with that goose silhouette. Use those, then go to your field marks. Then consider, can you hear it? And finally, your context. And your context is not as urgent because the other things, if the bird flies away, you can't gather any more information from it. Context is one of those things, well, you know where you saw the bird. And if you saw a behavior, you also can take that into, into consideration. But you know where you saw the bird. You know when you saw the bird. Date is also context. So consider those last. Okay, so shape. You know a lot more birds than you probably even realize. So you could probably start to identify some of these. Um, and, and maybe you can't identify them to species, but you can at least start to narrow them down. So that, that bird that's in the top right under the Audubon Rockies for me, most of you can probably say that's a waterfowl of some kind, probably a goose based on its shape. Okay, it's not as squat as we would expect a duck to be. Um, and now these birds, size would not help us in this case because I, I made them so that their sizes were not helpful. We're only going off of shape. The bird in the top left, under shape, clearly that is some sort of hawk, right? We know that's some sort of raptor. The bird in the middle, if you've ever been to Oklahoma or Texas or, or really that south central part of the United States, this bird is known for its long scissor-like tail, and it's called a scissor tail flycatcher. The bird on the bottom left uh, in the marshy area, there's a little bit of context there with the habitat. You know, it's, it's clearly walking through some sort of wet grasses. So it's some sort of wading bird. Maybe it would lead you to heron or egret. Okay? And, and then the bottom right bird, that bird has something very unusual where its bottom part of its bill is longer than the top part. And that would be very helpful in shape if there was a bird that then, when you referenced your field guide, matched that. So those are the things that when you see a bird, very first thing, take into consideration that shape, okay? Then, oh, before we go to then, an example, two birds that come from the high Arctic that, that migrate down into the lower 48 in wintertime, they can look somewhat similar depending on how light colored each of them is but the snowy owl has a much uh, more rotund shape a thicker neck than say the rough-legged hawk which has a much more narrow head okay so take into consideration that shape and then you move to size now when you move to size we, we like to tell people start with these common reference birds because these are birds that most of you even if you're not a bird watcher, you would already know them. So the American crow, the American robin, and the house sparrow, very common birds throughout the U.S. Start with them because they're just great points of reference. And think about, is it bigger than a crow? Is it smaller than a crow? Is it larger than a robin? Smaller than a robin? Is it smaller than a sparrow? Is it between a robin and a sparrow? Use them for your context of size. So that when, when you see a bird, okay, how does it relate to a robin? Now, there's a, a tip I teach people with your, your field guides. If you're using Sibley, Sibley's organized taxonomically. Now, that may not mean a lot to you if you don't know taxonomy, but what it does do is it actually allows us a, a quick cheat. And I call it a cheat because it doesn't work completely all the time, but it is helpful to people who are new. So if you have a Sibley field guide, Pretty much any bird larger than a crow is in the front third of your field guide. Any bird that's crow to robin size is in the middle of your field guide. And any bird that's smaller than a robin, for the most part, and there are exceptions, but any bird that's robin size or smaller is going to be towards the back of your field guide. And that's just a quick way then to know, okay, I saw a bird, it was larger than a crow, head to the front of the field guide. And if I go past the midway point, I probably have gone too far, okay? It doesn't always work. There's exceptions. Hummingbirds are almost smack dab in the middle of the field guide, so hummingbirds don't count. But generally speaking, it is a helpful cheat for getting to areas of your field guide quickly. However, I would recommend just learning bird taxonomy 
and then you'll know where those birds are in your field guide, okay? So use these birds as your common reference so that when you see a bird like a blue jay, you can be like, well, it's, it's okay. So I see this bird, it's larger than a robin, but not as big as a crow, it's blue. Head to the middle of your field guide where in between crows and robins, a lot of birds that are that size are, and you would maybe stumble upon blue jay, okay? So shape, then size, and then field marks. Because a lot of people, they'll jump straight to field marks. And the problem is a lot of birds can share similar field marks that aren't even close to the same shape or size. So start with shape and size and build up to field marks like this lark sparrow, which provides us a great example of some beautiful face marks, okay? Now your, your field marks, if you, if you have a physical field guide, remember those first 34 pages I told you to read, it explains all of the field marks on various types of birds and how the guide describes them. So that's why reading those first pages are critical because they teach you, hey, you gotta know this stuff because the book refers to them, okay? Everything from a crown stripe to a supercilium, which kind of looks like the eyebrow area there, to the mailer, to the chest spot, to the nape, all of these are going to be terms you will see used in a field guide. So you will want to learn these. If you have a physical field guide, like I said, front of your field guide, and if you have something like an app, some apps actually provide this information in the introductory parts of the app, okay? So you'll want to explore your app to figure out, does it have those things, okay? Um, and if you're using one of the apps that also helps you identify, they will actually ask you about field marks sometimes. Did it have wing bars? Did it have an eye ring, et cetera? So learn the field marks, learn their names because they are terms that will be used frequently in field guides and by other bird watchers. So that's all the visual. Now we move to the audible, okay? Um, what can we hear? And you probably know a lot more bird sounds than, than maybe you, you realize. Think of the turkey. Most of us know a turkey sound, right? You probably already know hens, you know, go duck, 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 and then the males go go, 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 right? You know those basic sounds. So start with those, and then you can eliminate, okay, that's not a bird I've ever heard before. I know, I know robins, I know turkeys, I know uh, maybe red-tailed hawk, and then you can start to eliminate from there if you get to hear the sound. Even if you can't identify a bird by its sound, still use the sound as a locator tool. I heard the sound, now I'm gonna follow the sound to where the bird is so that I can identify it visually. There are helpful uh, uh, mnemonic devices that people will use to learn bird sounds um, where they'll, they'll describe them with words to help memorize the patterns. Um, for instance, the, the crow is caw, caw, caw. The raven is eh, eh, eh. And if you live in a place where a fish crow is, a fish crow sounds like a regular crow with its nose plugged up. Caw, caw, caw. So use, use these, these fun uh, and oftentimes interesting ways to, to learn bird sounds um, because they're, they're very helpful. Um, unless you have an ear for music. People who have musically inclined ears oftentimes do not need these, these learning tools, okay? Where do birds occur? So this is context. So we've, we've handled the, the visible, the audible. Now let's go into the contextual. So habitat, where do birds occur? Think about what they need. They need food, they need water, they need cover. Some birds spend most of their time in the air. Some birds spend almost all their times in flocks. Think about these contextual things, okay? And it'll help you to find birds and then use that context of where you found that bird to identify it. So look in those places of need and or comfort. For instance, you are likely not going to see common goldeneye, which are the, the two ducks on the left, male and female, common goldeneye. You're not likely to see them in the saguaro desert. That's just not probable unless there's a giant body of water uh, in the midst of it, but that's usually not very natural. So think about that, that's context. Well, would you expect to see a duck out there? Probably not, then maybe it wasn't a duck which you saw. 
So where would you see a duck like these hooded mergansers in a wetland habitat? Okay. How about feeder birds? Some birds will not come to feeders. You can try as hard as you want. You'll just never get them to your feeders. However, some birds are regular feeder visitors, like the evening grosbeak, which is the bird there on the left, or the uh, American goldfinches, which you can see are all over this feeder here on the right. So think about that. What birds are what birds are likely to visit your feeder? If you think you saw a, uh, uh, let's say, oh, uh, a great blue heron at your, your bird feeder, you might want to think about, well, is that a likely species? If not, what could I have seen? Now, if you have a great blue heron visiting your, your pond and eating your goldfish, that is very likely and very possible. Um, other birds, wintertime birds that only visit in the winter, think about where they're going to be. They're going to be in areas that are similar to, uh, you know, habitat that they would experience, you know, on, on uh, their, their breeding and, and migration grounds. So things like Lapland longspur and, and snow buntings prefer oftentimes ag areas that uh, are wide open and flat and covered in a lot of snow and ice. The American tree sparrow, brushy habitat, especially in riparian areas. Where are you going to find a red cross bill? Well, red cross bills, they have that crossed bill specifically for splitting open pine cones. So where are you going to find them? In areas where there's ample pine cones. Context, okay? Think about context. Another part of context is behavior, and there's very distinct behaviors, and some birds have such distinct behaviors that you can just see the behavior to identify the species. For instance, woodpeckers. What do woodpeckers do? They peck on trees, and they do a very good job of it, okay? So think about these distinct behaviors. The way birds forage, meaning the way they look for food. Nut hatches crawl up and down trees head first. Brown creepers, similar. However, they only go head up the tree. Nut hatches will go head down and head up. Creepers only go up. Other behaviors. Warblers have very distinct behaviors in that it's like they never stop moving. High energy, always on the go. So warblers are a species where you just see a little bird flitting around inside the trees, gleaning insects or fly catching. Warblers, very distinct behaviors in that they're always moving. Rarely will they sit still for you, which can lead to frustration through the binoculars. Think of your, your large buteos, your big day raptors, your diurnal raptors. They spend a lot of their time soaring, looking for food. That's a distinct behavior. If you see a large bird soaring, you would not go to something like, uh, like a turkey. You're not going to see a turkey soaring high on thermals. Now you will see turkeys gliding into areas. Turkeys can fly and they actually will roost in trees, but you're not going to see them soaring on thermals. So consider that context, behavior. What are they doing? Is the behavior distinct or can it help me eliminate other species? Okay. Normally I'd, I'd spend a little bit more time and we'd go through this, but where I can't interact with everyone as much, uh, the silhouette image is, is not as helpful. But what I what I want you to pull away from this is you're getting a lot more information than maybe you you would initially think from this image. You're getting you're getting size, you're getting shape, you're getting context, and you're getting a lot of different context. You're getting behavior. Notice the woodpecker on the tree. It's behaving like a woodpecker is, right? The birds on the wire are all flocked together. Starlings are frequently found in large flocks. There's a wading bird, okay? Um, so there's some context there. The only thing we're not getting from this image is the audible, okay? So even if you're given very minimal information, you can still gather a decent amount of information from even just the quickest glimpse of a bird. So when you see that bird, observe it, okay? Consider its, its family by its shape and size, okay? So for instance, the bird on the right, we can't tell its size, but we can tell its shape. It has a very long, chisel-like beak. Then consider the field marks. It's got a red throat. It's got a red forehead. And it's got a little bit of red on the back of its nape. Behavior. Now, this bird, obviously, we can't see much behavior going on here. But we'd probably see it climbing all over a tree. Listen for vocalizations. Sometimes you won't get them. 
And if not, then you go with what, what information you do have. And then consider your context. Where are you? What time of year is it? Because your field guide will tell you, this bird's really only in this area in the breeding season or the wintering season. And then consider where you are and what habitat you're in. If you have a camera, photographs are, are great to go back to help you remember what you saw. But if you don't, or if photography is not your thing, maybe take notes. If you written notes are your thing, take written notes. Maybe it's you record on a little uh, voice recorder. Maybe you make a sketch of the bird if, if you're very artistic. Do all of those things. Go through all of that. Get as much information as you can from that bird before you go to your field guide. One of the most frustrating things is when you observe a bird in the field and the first thing a new birder will do, they'll see the bird and they'll immediately open up their field guide. But do you know what happens in that three to four seconds when you're opening up your field guide trying to thumb to the right page? That bird flies away. And those three to four seconds could have been spent catching another behavior, seeing another field mark that you initially missed, all of those things. So do your best to get as much information off that bird before you go to your field guide. Okay? And refer back to this wonderful web of identification. What's visible, what's audible, and what is my context? Okay, and then you can step through your steps to identification. Okay. Um, so lastly, uh, last couple of things here as we're wrapping up. Uh, learn your field guide. Whichever guide you decide to use, if it's, a, if it's an app, if it's a, a physical guide, learn it. Learn the ins and outs of it. Learn where everything is laid out. You can sort it if you would like. If you learn the families. Or if you don't, you can still just put tabs of, hey, waterfowl are here. Put a little tab in your book so you can quickly flip to waterfowl. Crows, ravens, and jays are here. Quickly flip to those. Blackbirds are all the way back here. Put a tab there. Excuse me. Learn your field guide and make it for yourself. Okay, it's, it's just printed in a way for everybody. So then make it yours. Personalize it to help you be better. Um, and then... Within the field guide, there are large plates that actually show all of the family members or, or the birds that are being grouped together for identification purposes so that you can see them all and then you can try to narrow it down with a single image and then flip to the page where more images are and you can finish your identification there. Okay, and so in, in a normal presentation, then we'd go through some, some uh, bird photos, but where we can interact, it makes it a little bit tougher. Um, but just as an example, you see these birds. We can't hear them. So automatically cross out the audible, okay? What's visual? So shape, okay? Take in their shape. What is the shape of their bill? What's the shape of their head? The shape of their body? We can't get size off of them. However, these photos are somewhat to scale. So these birds are about the same size, okay? Then we go to markings. Now, these birds exhibit some similar markings and some different markings. Make notes of those. Well, the bird on the right has yellow above its eye. Now, if, if you've learned your, your, um, your field marks, your bird topography, you would know that area where it's yellow is called the lore. And the lores on the bird on the left are black. So use that. The color of the bill, okay? The size of the crown stripes. Um, look at that throat area. One side is gray, one side is white. Use your field marks then. And then consider your context. Now we have very little context here. These habitats, these, I mean, this could be just mere feet away from each other potentially. Um, so you'd have to take that into consideration if you saw that bird in the wild, okay? But field marks wise, we actually can eliminate these two birds. The one on the left is the white crowned sparrow. And the one on the right under the Audubon Rockies is the white throated sparrow. Again, superficially similar in that they both have black and white crown stripes but there are enough field marks to help us separate those identification, okay? Um, so that's where we'll stop, uh, and I'll go to questions now. I'm gonna shut down my, my PowerPoint here, and I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay, so I see, I see some, some questions here, and, and if you asked them earlier on, I do apologize. I could not see them until 
just now. So I'll start at the top here. Interesting on how size can be used in the Sibley Guide. Yes, and, and again, it's a cheat. It's not a guarantee. It will not always work for you, but it can help you if you see a bird, you know, as I said, larger than a crow, stick to the front of your guide. It's, it's not always going to work, but it's a nice quick cheat that helps you, at least in the initial stages. Eventually, you will just know your field guide. You will, absolutely. Who says potato chip? So the little, little yellow bird flies in little semicircles, says potato chip as it flies along. That is the American goldfinch. Okay, best, so best time of day to bird. The best time of day to bird depends on what you're looking for, but generally morning is considered the best time of day to bird. Now on really cold mornings, you may have to wait till mid morning. Um, but generally speaking, morning is the best time of day to bird, evening, second best, and then everything else is just, hey, if you're birding, you're having a good time, right? So the rest of it's still good, but those are generally the best. Um, Oh, great question. So can anyone, even a beginner, join the Christmas bird counts? So yes, Christmas bird counts are an annual event from December 14th to January 4th or 5th. I think January 5th. They're annual events and they happen all across the country. So if you're anywhere in Colorado, there are tons of Christmas bird counts in Colorado. I cannot remember the number off the top of my head, but there are a lot of Christmas bird counts in Colorado. And a simple way, uh, to, to find out who organizes your Christmas bird count and to register and, and ask to be able to participate, even if you have no bird identification skills whatsoever. Maybe you don't even have binoculars. You're, you'll want to just go to uh, Audubon Christmas bird count. You want to search that into Google. I think it's just cbc.org, maybe even. It's a, a B, Christmas bird count, CBC. Uh, and there's a list. Uh, it's, a, it's actually a map where you can then zoom in on your location and find out your nearest Christmas bird count, and it will tell you who to contact. It'll give you email, phone number, various ways to contact them so you can participate too. And it's a lot of fun. Oftentimes there's a big uh, potluck afterwards where people get together and, you know, who knows if it, that'll happen that way this year, but they'll get together and they'll share fun stories from the day. And usually there's, there's always, you know, there's a couple good stories. I've, I've had my fair shares of, uh, you know, getting very much stuck and having to dig out a vehicle or you see some really cool bird or, or maybe you see a non-bird, you know, maybe you see a, a mountain lion while you're out uh, several years ago. We had that happen. So you just don't know what's going to happen. And they're great ways to meet new birders and, and get introduced into uh, the birding world. Oh, and then uh, another question here, how do you join the Audubon Society? So uh, the Arkansas Valley Audubon Society. If, if you're interested in, in joining there, um, I believe it is socobirds.org, Southern Colorado. So S O C O birds.org. Okay. Um, and then if you're wanting to join uh, Audubon on, on the, the regional level, Audubon Rockies, which is who I work for, we are part of National Audubon Society. So if you join Audubon Rockies, you're, you're joining National Audubon Society. Um, but you're, you're benefiting the region. And so if you want to join that way, it is rockies.audubon.org. You can join online. Uh, it's a real simple process and you can join that way and you'll still get the Audubon magazine and uh, the, other, the other benefits of joining Audubon. Any other questions? Looks like I, I got through all the questions there and I didn't go too far over time. If there are no other questions, then I will turn it back over. Let's see here. I don't think I have to do anything. Megan's back. There we go. You're on mute. <laughs> we can't hear you. <laughs> there. Now you can hear right. me. Um, thank you so much for 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 doing this. I personally learned a lot. I have been, I was one of those people that just went straight for the plates. Um, so now I know to actually read. Um, so thank you so much. And also just for everybody who's watching, we're gonna do these once a month with Audubon. They've generously um, collaborated with us. So please, um, where you're watching now, we'll have them um, again um, once a month. So thank you so much for watching and, and thanks for joining us, Zach, and doing such a great presentation. Yes, thank you to uh, Arkansas Valley Audubon and the Publicity County Library for inviting me. I really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. Sorry I didn't get to interact with everybody, but I hope you enjoyed it. All right. Well, thank you so much.